So thank you all so much for being here. Thank you so much, Tracy, for being here for a very special talk for, to celebrate International Women's Day. We are currently sitting inside We Do Not Sleep, which is an exhibition that brings together female identifying artists in the TK studios, and of course, Tracy as well. And it's a really special occasion. I think International Women's Day is always a funny one, but I think in a way it's necessary because it makes us reflect on the women who are here today and those um, who are gone as well. Um, Tracy, it's so special to be here. One year on, after TKE historically opened a year ago, I'm, I'm just hoping that many of you came to that amazing occasion where the sun came out just as you cut the ribbon and we had the local choir sing just like a prayer by Madonna. How does it feel one year on to be here? Well, I don't know. At the moment, I'm just trying to calm down from getting here so late. And I, and I know all the trains are fucked up from London, so I was hoping that Alyssa was going to call and say, don't hurry, because lots of people aren't here yet because of the trains. But I think a lot of people here are from Margate, which is absolutely brilliant. Because what to answer Katie's question, I would say one year on from now on, how many people from Margate thought this event could happen on this level, of this calibre, with someone like Katie interviewing me? I'm telling you, if we were doing this talk in London, we, <laughs> there would be like 500 people for Katie and 500 people for me. And as it is, we're doing it in this really special moment. It's like history being made. Because for anyone who lives in Margate, you'll know how much things have changed in the last few years and how much things have changed in the last year since I've done this. And I think it's not just for me, this, this, these studios, the tier program, everything. I think it's actually really pretty beneficial to Margate. And um, I always say this thing, I say a lot of women have ships and boats named after them, but not many women own them. <laughs> and I feel pretty proud to own this ship, so it's good. When was it the moment that you decided to do TK? It's, it's a really, really good story. So, I've been friends with Carl Friedman for 33 years. Carl is the person that persuaded me to go halves with the, what we call the 60s building on Union Crescent. And then Carl got that, and then Carl decided that he wanted to expand with his print works and everything. And he saw this building, and he decided that he was going to buy it. He did all the searches, he did everything, and he was going to do it. And then right at the last minute, he decided that he didn't want to do it, and he was quite happy with everything that he had. And we were at my place, and it was like November, and it was really cold and windy. And, re you know, one of those really bad Margate nights, and there was me, Carl, and Rob... And we'd just been really stupid, giggling, mucking around and everything. And then Carl told us that he wasn't going to buy, get, get this building. And we are going, but it's such a brilliant building. What's going to happen to it? It's such a brilliant building. Now, this building has a charge on it of 50%. And a charge means that any profit that's made on this building, 50% of that profit goes back to the council. So it's not a good investment if you maybe have children, someone wants to inherit it or whatever, and it's not a good investment if you're a property developer and you wanted to build 10 houses here. It's not a good investment if you wanted to open shops. It's not anything you plan to do. Thanet Council would get 50% of the, of, the, of the profit because it was a protected building, because it was this old bathhouse, because it was always a community building, because it was an educational building. And we're sitting there, we're going, God, it's just too good to just let it slip away. And then, and then Carl and Rob said, you should have it open an art school. And I went, yeah, that's a really good idea. And within a week, I'd bought it. <laughs> <laughs> and it was good because the, the charity that owned it, because of um, lockdown and everything, they were going to go into liquidation if they didn't sell it. And it looked like no one was going to buy it, it because of the charge thing, it was really difficult. But of course, for me, because I wanted it for educational process purposes, and it's not for me, you know, it's not for profit, it's not for anything. It was absolutely ideal, and the council was, everybody was happy, Carl was happy, we're all happy, look, we're all <laughs> like, So it was just a win. It was a Thursday night, and by the following Friday, I'd bought it. 
So, and my God, my, my lawyers had to work fast on that one. But we did it, and, and, and it's fantastic because, first of all, I wasn't going to be over ambitious. I just thought, get some artists in, leave them to it. And then I thought, no, no, no maybe I'll paint it white. Maybe I'll get rid of it. And I said to Lindsay, oh, I'm going to leave the carpet. She goes, you can't leave the carpet. And it took us weeks taking the carpet up. And then I put the lino down and it went on and on and on. And, and you know, from this sort of like, oh, I'll just buy it and let artists use it. It's become really, really proper and it's becoming established. And, it's in, and just our gallery, our, our exhibition programme now is getting quite... It's very organic, but it's actually really a really nice thing. The tears have been here one year now. Tears, they've done a year, so that's that's pretty brilliant. And um, it's just going from strength to strength, really. It so. really is. I mean, just looking around this exhibition, just the calibre already. So many of the artists have just developed so much in such a short period of time. But I mean, you've spoken about this idea of an artist being more than just an artist in terms of just making their work, and it's about community building. I mean. What community did you want to create here in Margate? Uh, when was it? About, I can't remember how long ago it was. Maybe six, seven years ago, I turned the lights on at Dreamland. And it was, it was about like 80 people there and I turned the lights on. Not inside Dreamland, but you know, the Dreamland lights. And um, by the way, for quite a long time, it said Amland, <laughs> right? <laughs> and if anybody, is it, does anybody here speak Turkish? No? Um? So um in Turkish doesn't mean vagina, it actually means cunt. <laughs> so for months and months and months, every time I walked up, got out the station or whatever, I would giggle to myself anyway. It's, but, but unfortunately now we don't even have the lights on at all. So, but anyway, I'd rather have had Amland than nothing anyway. So, um, so anyway, I turned the Amland lights on and, um, and, and Dreamland. And I gave this sort of rip-roaring speech of, on the steps of Dreamland here. We're going to make Margate the epicentre of the creative world, you know. Just because we're on the edge, it doesn't mean to say we can't be in the centre. We're close to Europe, we're close to... Gave this whole sort of little speech thing about how Margate could be the epicentre of creativity <coughs> for the UK. Now my speech sounds slightly different. My speech says that we should be the um, uh, town of culture for 2030. Or... 2034 whenever but I don't I don't you know and when I said that about being the epicenter of British culture people like what raised, rolled their eyes but actually Margate is a real destination I gave a talk in Australia a few weeks a couple of months ago in Sydney massive audience really like hundreds and hundreds of people and they were talking about Margate and I said before we talk about Margate can anybody in the audience put their hands up and say if they've heard of Margate and there is a Margate in Australia. And I said, not Australia, the one in the... And anyway, you know, the whole audience put their hand up. And I said, well, 20 years ago, 10 years ago, that never could have happened. This is phenomenal. And it's a really lovely thing wherever I go. And like when I was, had, did my show in New York, like everybody's going, oh, yeah, like next time I come to the UK, I've got to come to Margate. <laughs> and, th and there's some people now who come and visit me and they come here and they go around the town and everything. And they, and they, they come from Heathrow, they get in the car at Heathrow and they come to Margate. They see Margate as being a totally feasible place to be their first stop. And, and I think that's, that's pretty incredible. And there's... I don't know. I think it can only get better. So I um, think so. Yeah. And so when you were young and little girl growing up here, did you ever think that something like this would be possible? And it, it being that artistic town? No, I, c I couldn't wait to leave. <laughs> so, but saying that, in, on bank holidays and everything, Margate was really, cut, really very, very hip. So we had the mods, the rockers, the Hells Angels, the punks, the Azutex, the Bowie people, the, the you know, every kind of, like, uh, cultural uh, fashion trend group you could have would come to Margate on bank holidays. There would be the famous fights, there would be this, there would be that. But basically it was like a full-on fashion stream, fashion show, music, what was happening, you know. And there was a massive dance culture in Margate as well, and like a soul, soul culture, music, dancing. And I was quite a good dancer, 
and the people who danced and like the soul people were really like really fashionable and really cool and really hip and really trendy so I was part of all of this thing when I was like 13 14 so I was a, a part of something cool I was never part of anything suburban I was never part of being at school I didn't go to school I stopped going when I was 13 and everything I was involved in was about uh, being creative being imaginative being forward thinking and I really loved art I loved art but there was no art galleries there was only one bookshop the Albion bookshop up North Down Road there was always been lovelies so you could go uh, and, and can I say something I never ever shoplifted from lovelies ever <laughs> <laughs> or the bookshop it was probably the only two shops in Margate <laughs> that I respected enough not to put my filthy little hands on anything you know and and it was, and there, there was a, there still is a library, but it, you know, there was no culture here of, of like no museums. Well, there was Quex, Quex Museum, which, and and if, has anyone been to Quex Museum here? Yes, no, yes. Well, go. It's really amazing and absolutely fascinating, but um, it, it was, it's, it has these fantastic dioramas of Africa and lots of stuffed animals, and. People would have thought that it, maybe people think that it's not particularly ideologically sound now, but it was a, p a point in history where those things were possible stuffed animals, um, anthropological sort of like research into indigenous people of Africa or whatever. So it's kind of fascinating as a as a time capsule, but that was the nearest we got to culture, that and Dover Castle and Richborough Power Station, which was always something amazing, if you want to think about 1950s industrial sort of like post-nuclear nuclear architecture, it was fascinating, but there was nothing, absolutely nothing. So it's not like, oh yeah, you know, when I was when I was six and my mum and dad took me to the Tate for the first time, or I remember the first time I went to the National Gallery when I was seven, or there was nothing. It was barren. And all that we had was all that we made, all that we saw, all that we created. There was nothing. That was Margate. And that's why I'm so happy about Turner Contemporary. And when about... No, eight years ago at Turner Contemporary, I gave a talk to Thanet's best O-level art and A-level art students, the ones that had done best in their exams. And it was, I cried. It was so amazing. Because I was thinking, Christ, if I'd have been at school doing art and this had been available to me, I might have been a successful artist or something. <laughs> <laughs> Back to that childhood as well, because the the, the the overall arching theme of Thanet's festival is the power of women. And as a child, were there particular women who you looked up to or who helped you get to the next stage in life? Yeah, well, there was, well, obviously my mum and my nan. And, but in my nan, definitely. My mum, in a round, strange way, my mum wasn't always around, so my mum... It enforced a really great level of independence in me, you know. So um, I had this brilliant, my mum's dead, and I had this brilliant dream. This sums up my mum completely, right? So I was in France, in my house in France, and I woke up. No, I, and I had this dream that I was, I was, I was like really, really, really hot and sort of like really... And, and everything, and I, and I woke up, and my mum was next to me, and then I was really cold, and I said to my mum, I'm so cold now, I'm so cold, and my mum turned, she said, Tracy, it's better than burning to death, like this, and I was like, it's, a, it's this dream, I was like, hot, cold, anyway, so, and then I woke up, and I thought, oh, what a weird dream, hot, cold, hot, cold, and I went, I went downstairs, and when, and I went, when I went downstairs, I just got these new curtain, really old fabric curtains put up, and I'd forgotten there was a heater, and I turned the light on and the heater on at the same time, and I was in bed, and I could just see when I got up and looked, 
all the curtains were smouldering with smoke oh. coming. And there was no way I smelt it, no way I knew about it. And what a weird dream that I had about my mum. But that's kind of what my mum would be like. So I think, oh, don't talk to me like that, mum. When actually she's really saying to me, get your act together, the house is burning down, you know? <laughs> so my mum, the way my mum gave me this level of independence was very different from other people's mums and parents because my mum was not around a lot of the time. So I had that. Then I had my nan who, who looked after me a lot um, when I was little and brought me up. And then I had a couple of school teachers, Mrs Morris, who was my art teacher, and Mrs Cross, who was my drama teacher. But a lot of that was all over for me when, when, when I was like 13 or something. I dropped out of school. I went back when I was 15 by law because I had to go back three days a week. Otherwise, my mum, we would have got a W13 and my mum would have had social services and all that kind of thing. So I went back to school three days a week and the art department just said, oh, just let her do whatever she wants. And hey, presto, that's what happens when you say to a delinquent 15-year-old, what do you like doing? And they say, I like art. They say, go on then, off you go. And I think schools aren't compassionate enough, not understanding enough, and not trusting enough in people who aren't academic. I mean, I'm not academic in the slightest. I never will be, I never can be. But visually, I'm smarter than a lot of people. And my art teachers recognise that, and they let me do art three days a week. Rather than me be in trouble, rather than my mum be in trouble, rather than social services, rather than me acting out and, and sort of being, um, getting worse and in more trouble or something. So I, th I think that, I wish I'd gone to one of those, what's it, Steiner schools or something. <laughs> Monte, 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 Montessori. Monte, Monte, Montessori, I was going to say. <laughs> Montessori, yeah, I would have excelled, I reckon, yeah. Could have been a successful artist. I could have been a successful artist, yeah. No, but seriously, I think if you go back to what inspired me, what helped me, I would definitely say to doing the three days a week art school and the bit of drama. So, definitely. Mm. And were there any women artists as well. I mean, I know that you were great friends with Louise Bourgeois, and I'd love to know a bit about how maybe she taught you about being a woman or helped you shape, maybe not. <laughs> <laughs> Louise, the first time I met Louise, she shouted at me in French for about 10 minutes, and I was going, oh, God, like this war. And, um, and Jerry, J uh, Jerry Gorovoy, who's Louise's 30-year assistant, said, Louise, Tracy doesn't speak French. Louise, Louise, you're mad. Da, da. She's going really crazy. And what she, she said to me, how long have you been coming to New York? And I said, oh, about 11 years. And that was it. She went mad. And what she was saying, you've been coming here for 11 years and you never come to see me. <laughs> and she was really angry with me so for not coming to see her earlier. But she was formidable. She was, like, incredible. And if Louise influenced me about anything, it was about scale. I, I was always impressed at how Louise could work really, really big and then do these beautiful, tiny little etchings that are really myopic kind of thing. And um, I, my work isn't anything like Louise's. It never has been, because where I'm coming from is a very different place from Louise. Louise is coming from the most intelligent academic sources and, and the way she thought and the way she worked, you know, she, Louise could have been a scientist. She could have been a professor in anything, whereas I, I couldn't do that. And, and Louise was in, incredibly knowledgeable as well. So all of her personal thoughts and how she did her work was also having a conversation with, say, it could be a conversation with Freud, or it could be a conversation with Jung, or it could be... She was in a different dialogue from me. I was in a dialogue only with one person, that's myself. And Louise was in a dialogue with, with this sort of incredibly vast world that surrounded her, that orbited her. And, um, yeah, and her work... When I first heard about Louise, I thought she was the same age as me. And even though her work was like dated, sort of like things like 1949 or 1952 or 1964, I thought she was like me. She just put down the date she felt like. <laughs> and I thought, oh yeah, that's kind of cool. And then I went and saw a show of her etchings 
And I thought, it's so weird, because if I didn't know better, I'd say that was the real thing. They really look like surrealist work from the time. They don't look like they've been... It doesn't, you know, for all I know, it could look like someone of 80 could have made them, you know. And she was 80 when she was making them. <laughs> and and it, was, it was brilliant when I found out how old she was. I just, I don't know, I didn't research. I just looked at her work, just looked at it. And I thought she was the same age as me. So it was amazing when I met her and we got on so well. So, yeah. Were there any other women artists or women in your life who helped guide you at all? Paula Rago or...? Well, Paula Rega was much, she's actually quite a rollist when I start thinking about it. Paula Rega was my, my external tutor at the Royal College of Art. So I'd see Paula about once every six weeks. And so that was pretty cool. And she was like, she was always, she'd always had a couple of drinks and I'd see her after lunchtime. And I have the feeling that she smoked, but it, it might not have been her. It was definitely me. It was definitely me. And I got on well with her, and she was really, she was so cool, Paula. And also, the other thing about her is that for a long time, her work wasn't fashionable at all, not one single bit. And, but I always loved her work because I made figurative, figurative work, which wasn't fashionable. It wasn't fashionable in the <laughs> 80s, certainly wasn't fashionable in the 90s, but someone like Paula didn't give a fuck. She just carried on and carried on. And now, well, she's like, you know, she's one of the, greatest female artists that we've had. So, yes, that's Paula. Who else? Go on. Can you think of any more? She knows more about my life than I do. <laughs> um, no, I mean, I, I, you know, my biggest influences have been male. So, in terms of art, so, that, you know, Edvard Munch uh, and um, Egon Schiele, and you know, most most of my big influences are dead people. So, and art history, and and movements of artists, for example. But because I've always made work about one thing, and that's my experience of life and what I witness and what I feel, I haven't had to actually, as an adult, I haven't really had to look at anybody else. I just look inward. And I think in the 90s, that's why people thought I was narcissistic. And uh, because I was myopic and I looked inward, but they didn't understand that I was a woman just talking about lots of things that no one else spoke about at the time. Now, more and more people are talking about it. Like, there's loads of women in America now, artists, making work about abortion because, you know, they're on the line. If they don't start talking about it and making work about it and standing up for themselves, no, you know, well, most of America now, you can't have an abortion. You don't have a right to your own body or, or, or freedom of choice or, you know. And I've been making work about abortion for so long. And, and I remember people going, oh, she's not droning on about abortion again, rolling their eyes. Well, let me go on and drone on about abortion in Texas and see how long it takes before I get a bullet in my head. Do you know what I mean? It really does matter how a woman is and how a woman's life is and what affects her, whether it's me, whether it's you, whether it's you, it matters to all of us. And the fact that being like, so teenage sex, rape, abortion, sexual abuse, especially, it's, you know, it, it's women, it, women, International Women's Day, I'm not celebrating. I'm not celebrating today because of so many atrocities that are happening in the world as we sit here now. What the fuck have we got to celebrate about? Women still being burnt to death, women still being raped, women still being stoned. All of us that are women sitting here, we could be in other countries and, and we'd, be, we'd be arrested before we left this room. We'd be arrested for being in this room. So it's not over yet. It, it, equality has got so far to go between men, between between the sexes. It's it's almost like I sound old-fashioned. I sound like an old-fashioned feminist. Well, I'm not. I'm a woman who's completely aware of what's happening in the 21st century, and I don't like it. And I also know, 400 years ago, I would have been burnt as a witch, definitely, without a doubt. Because any woman that took any power, that did anything... All right, you've got great people like Bess of Hardwick. You've got great examples in history, you know, Lady Hamilton. But they soon, you know, pushed her out of the way. You've got these women that actually made a stand for themselves. But they, it, 
you know, very few people either know them as being good. No one knows those women as being good. Most people don't even know a lot of the women who changed history because they got written out of history. And it's not me, I'm not droning on about it and I'm not on some feminist rant, but I'm just saying, as a woman, it is extremely difficult to do things, especially if you're on your own. So... Mm. But then I think what's remarkable about what you've done and, you know, being so influential to so many people is we see someone make it possible to create a space that is about community and about artistic conversation and building <coughs> artistic careers. And, you know, we look around at this show and we see a community of people through artworks that you've built. And so what I love about this show, We Do Not Sleep as well, it, it concentrates on a subject that perhaps also doesn't always get the limelight it does. This idea of rest, this idea of sleep for a woman. I mean, why did you want to put this particular exhibition together? Well, I wanted to put the exhibition together for PAL and, and be supportive to them and do an event for them in Thanet. And, and I also thought it's really cool now. We've got so many women artists at the studio. I thought, I wonder if we could get a show together. And we have. It's, I'm really, really pleased at the level of the work and everything. But we do not sleep. The title came out because Alyssa said to me, we've got to get a title for the show, we've got to get a title for the show. And, and at the same time, I was trying to get a title for my show in Italy, in Florence, a title for my show in, um, at White Cube, a title for, honestly, a title for my book, a title, it was like title, crazy title time. I then also had to title all my paintings for my show in, in Belgium. And I was thinking, I can't think title, can't think of a title. And I just thought, oh God, I'm so tired. And then I, that's when I said it, we do not sleep. And Alyssa went, that's brilliant. That's so good. And I thought, yeah, it is. It's really good for women. <laughs> how many women don't sleep? Well, how many men don't sleep? But I think a lot of women don't sleep. And even my mum fell asleep on a, on a, holding a broom once because she was so tired. She fell asleep holding a broom. And have you heard this, you know the expression, on the ropes? Well, on the ropes, everybody thinks it's got something to do with being nautical, but it hasn't. On the ropes were for people who were down and out, and, and you'd have ropes that went from one side of the room to the other, one foot away from each other. And what you do is you pay like a, a halfpenny, and you'd hang on the rope like that, and you'd sleep on the rope standing up like this, in rows and rows and rows. And in my old studio in, um, what's that place? Oh, London, the East End. <laughs> <laughs> in Spitalfields. Um, it was, an, oh, it was uh, used as, as a safe house for women at the same time that Jack the Ripper was around. And, it was, um, and that's where women slept on the ropes. And that's where Annie Chapman was last seen before she, before she died. And I always think about this thing about, imagine these women so scared and then having to go in there and ask about all the fleas and all the lice and everything and them all hanging on these ropes. And, what, and that was in my studio. It was a bit freaky when I used to think about it. But the idea of women never being able to sleep women destitute, women out in the street, and what it must have been, and what it's like now even. And so you've got that kind of, you know, non-sleeping woman. Then you've got the women who are really fearful, who never sleep, they're too afraid to sleep. And then you've got women like me, who come in the spoilt category, you know, insomnia, can't sleep, and, and suffer from it. But still, if you're happy and you have insomnia, God has given you 24 hours a day. It's an amazing thing. If you're unhappy, then you're being tortured continuously. So, and I think there's a lot of women that, I mean, just, I mean, I would never do this, right? But childbirth, for example, women who have children, they don't sleep. They, they're awake the whole time, the whole time. I'd never do that. I couldn't do that, not with my art. But Every woman that's a mother has to do that. It's like torture. And the idea of not, not sleeping and then going to work the next day and then also having to look good. <laughs> it's kind of like, it's not, not a world that I could ever have taken part in, ever, and I realised that at the grand old age of 60. So. But I think it's also really interesting, this idea of 
rest with everything that's happened to you in the last few years as well? I mean, has this idea of rest taken on a whole new meaning for you? I cannot tell you how much, uh, how 20 past three today, all I wanted to do is have an hour's sleep, one hour's sleep. And I thought, if I can just have an hour's sleep, I'll be OK. But of course, there wasn't time. And I get really tired, I get really fatigued, because li I'm living without an organ, without a bladder. And when you're living without a bladder, it would be like living without your kidneys or living without, you know, whatever you're living without, your body has to compensate in some other way. And it makes me really, really tired, overly tired. So rest for me is really, 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 really important. And this morning I woke up at really early. I'd been awake, for, well, not really, it's about seven o'clock. And I'd been awake about 10 minutes and I was looking at my phone thinking, oh, what should I post about the show? And I was kind of like over excited and everything. And the next minute my bag exploded from me and I was just sat, it's like a tsunami of piss going all over me, all over my bed, everything. And like run to the bathroom and the depression in that situation and the, and the loathing of it all and to think, oh, not today, not today. I don't want this today. And those kind of things make me really fatigued and really mentally tired as well because I have to remember that I have a constant disability that people can't see and I'm always tired because of that and a lot a lot of I have to let I let a lot of people down as well and now I've stopped I was really nervous about this and tonight because what if I'm tired what if I'm too tired so it being that ill before with the cancer will always affect me it will never stop affecting me so but I don't I, it sounds like I'm moaning but I'm not I'm explaining and if anybody else here is doesn't have a bladder. Hey, soulmate, you know what it feels like. Yeah, it's it's tough. So, or or anybody that's in this any has any problem like this, or it it's not good. So it's not about someone. The most annoying thing that someone can say to me is, "God, it's so lucky it was your bladder." And I and I said, someone says that again, I'm going to reach inside their guts and I'm going to pull theirs out and slap it round their face. Because, like, living without a bladder is not a good idea, I promise you. It's not a good thing. And, and people think it's better than losing an eye or better than losing this or that. Anything you lose is, is, is not a good thing. That, and it affects you. It affects you mentally, physically, emotionally and... Um, yeah, so, but the cancer was really bad and I'm lucky I, I was given six months to live and I had this radical surgery and it was so radical that it worked. So I'm very lucky actually. So I, I'm, I'm not complaining, I'm very lucky and I don't drink anymore and I make the most of all my time now. So going back to Katie's thing about resting, I am either resting or working or talking to my cats. There's <laughs> nothing in between. Should be here tonight. Yeah. <laughs> no dogs but cats. Yeah. But I think what's extraordinary is you went through this, you know, these six months to live, and although you live with a disability, you have not slowed down in the sense that you have just... I mean, the, Tracy Emmons taken over the world. I mean, you know, I would witness what was happening in America. And it was just like this burst of energy in New York. Everyone knew about your show. I think something like 2,000 people came to the opening night. No one could even get in. And everything seems to have erupted in the most amazing way. Yeah, so it's a false impact. I said to someone, what would happen if, they, if someone said to you, OK, you can be a really successful artist, you go back to your hometown and create this beautiful world for yourself. You can do this, you can do that, but we're taking your bladder. <laughs> and I think that's kind of what happened to me because I've, I've, I've ended up being really happy. So, yeah, take my bladder, give me the disability, but I'm happier than I've ever been in my life. So, and I really, really, really mean it. Even when I'm sad, 
I'm still happier than I was before. Because before, I didn't appreciate, didn't understand, didn't understand my talent, didn't understand my strength, didn't understand my beautiful friendships with people, didn't understand the, how lucky I was surrounded by nature continuously with Margaret. There's all these really amazing positive things. And like my art, my painting, I love it. I love what I do. I enjoy it so much. I'm not saying the end result. I'm saying the action of it. Imagine waking up and thinking, oh, I'm going to paint today and be really nervous and really excited about it. And you're all on your own. It's such an amazing feeling. You, you can't beat it. It's like being in love. It's up there with totally that tingly feeling of being in love. And I made a neon once that says it's, it's different when you're in love. Everything is different when you're in love. Everything is different when you're making art that you love and you respond to. Everything. You, you feel alive. So imagine I'm here in Margate making my art, making the, <coughs> making the studios, making things possible for people. It, and, and I do lots in Margate as well. And I said this, in London, it's really hard to do things. Where I live, my house is in London. Our neighbours, our neighbour group, we wanted to get, help a local charity. Oh, my God. It was like we were being vetted. Do you know what I mean? Whereas here, you just give a load of money to the food bank, or you give a load of food to the food bank, or you give all your shampoo that you're not using to the food bank. And they say, thank you, that's so thoughtful. And you feel good about it. You think, yeah, I must remember to give, give them all the things that I don't use that are new, you know. And there's lots of things you can do in Margate that's very easy to change things. Whereas in big cities, I think it's a very, a very difficult thing to do. So I'm... I think my cancer, my illness, gave me time. A lot of, and also I was really lucky, it was during lockdown. I didn't miss any parties, <laughs> no one missed me, no one saw how ill I looked, I didn't have to deal with millions of visitors in the hospital, I could just be there on my own getting better. And you know, so for those reasons as well, I think it couldn't have come at a better time, couldn't have come at a better age for me, because it was like I cut off from all that. I was on a slippery slope a few years ago, in my 40s. In my 40s, I was like getting more and more and more and more, like Lim, Lim Barber said, I was getting more and more B-list, which I thought was really funny. <laughs> <laughs> it was fucking brilliant. <laughs> she meant like a career at it, you know. And, and she was right. I was skimming on this surface of something which was, wasn't me at all, in no way whatsoever. And now, after I feel like I've come round, I, I feel like I'm back to my 20-year-old self, which was, had an innocence, that had belief, that had soul, that was fighting, that was crusading, that I believe in things. And, and I feel back like that again. I'm back to Tracy. I've got my feet on the ground, you know, and I, I think I'm really lucky. So, yeah. That's why I think, for those who saw Tracy's show in America, there was an amazing title, title called The Beginning and the End of Everything. And it kind of summed it all up. It's saying goodbye to certain things and the beginning of things as well. Yeah, but I think that's also quite a cliche. It was a, a title of a painting, not the show. Um, and that's kind of like a cliche, but it, it is. There's this, I'm lucky. I've been given another chance to live, and I, I sort of think that I was supposed to die, and I sort of think they, whoever they are, up there, where, over there, whatever, they said, <laughs> look, we don't think that she's that bad. <laughs> She's, she fucked up a bit on the B-list thing, the drinking thing. The smoking 50 cigarettes a day was not good, right? But she hasn't actually done anything bad, but she hasn't actually done anything good. Let's give her a little bit, another chance, and let's see what she can come up with. Let's see what she can do. And I showed him. So, so now my thing is I said to someone, like, you know, like, um, this is not because I'm 17% Nubian Nile person, according to my DNA test the other day, right? But I, I'm building the things in Margate like a great Egyptian. I'm building my, my pyramids, my mausoleum, I'm building my temple, I'm building my, my last place where I'm going to be, I'm building my Karnak, I'm building my Heshep suit temple, I'm building everything I can. And when I die, 
I will have, will have this running without me, self-perpetuating, don't need me to run this, I'm organised, all that. My studio will be a museum where my ashes will be there, the cat's ashes will be there, everyone's ashes will be there, and, and my house will be like a little museum which people come to and things. And people will come to Margate for that, I know. I know they will. People come into Margate just for art anyway. And it's like, while I'm here, while I've got this second chance, I'm just living every day like it's my last, but like a great Egyptian would. So I'm building, 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 building. I'm not living my last days like, oh, it's the end, or I've, I've given up, or, or I'm going uh, uh, to sail around the world kind of thing. No, this is my world, and I'm going to build it and make it as best as possible. And while I'm busy building and working, it means I'm alive and I feel alive and it's, it, it keeps me alive. Why would anybody want to die when, when, you, when you've got all this around you? You wouldn't. And the more positivity that I surround myself with, the more, the more well and well and better I become. So that's, that's what I'm doing. So yeah, it's a bit selfish, but... On the other hand, it's keeping me alive and it's keeping me, it's keeping other people alive too. It's doing good things. I'm not doing anything bad. So it's not selfish in a way. It is, but it's not, if you know what I mean. Yeah. It's not selfish in the slightest because also it's the work that you put out. You're such a selfless person. The opportunities that you give people, the way that you allow people to live in a certain way and live with freedoms to be able to do their art. It's like the greatest sort of example of teaching, I think, the fact that if you have the power to give that selfless gift, you give it. Yeah, but some people take advantage of a situation and some people don't understand what a good thing is. So it's like me, with all the opportunities I've been given in my life, I really made the most of them, whether it's from my galleries, whether it's from my art education, um, you know, and I, I always worked really, really hard and, and I think, first, with, with young people now, I think that they really don't understand... Things are really difficult, but I, I also don't think they understand when opportunity comes. I think they um and ah and think, mm, do I want to do this or do I want to... Just do it. That's what I say. Don't um and ah. Don't say, well, is it going to be difficult? Will I be able to do it? No, just go ahead and do it. And it's like I tell everybody who's applying to art school, they go, oh, well, I won't be able to pay the fees back. I said, you don't, if you haven't got the money, you don't have to. Just go and get the education. Then decide, then work out how you're going to pay things back. But if you don't get the education, you'll never be able to do anything. So go and get the education. So um, I'm, I'm very pro-education, very pro-art education. I'm really hoping that things are going to change in schools in the next year or so with art education because I think a lot of kids that are on the wrong side of the tracks, say, make really, really good artists because they think out of the box. They're individuals, they're unique, they've got energy and they're not bogged down by loads of academic stuff. They're much free, freer thinkers. So, I'd, I'd, so my thing is as well, with the government, for example, with art, Instead of me, I've tried having a go at government, I've tried talking to governments, I've sat down at tables with governments, I've been promised things by governments, but I've been let down. So my thing is, well, sod you, I'll just go off and do it on my own then. And I'm hoping what I'm doing here could be a role model for other, other people who, who've got the resources or the energy that they would do it. I mean, it doesn't have to be for art, does it? It could be for sport, it could be for science, it could be for anything. So, yeah, it's, 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 yeah, I'm literally putting my money where my mouth is, so. Hmm. You are. And just before we open up to questions, I'd love for you just to talk about the works that you've chosen to put in the show. Well, uh, they're really recent works. This one, I think, I can't remember when I did it, Harry will know, maybe either just after Christmas, after Christmas just after Christmas, yeah. and this yeah, and this one I did about three weeks ago, two weeks ago, two weeks ago, a week ago, a week ago. oh my god, <laughs> yeah, yeah, a week ago, I can't, I can't remember, I can't remember, and, and these, these are very raw, they're on the raw canvas, they're like big drawings, but 
I, I really, really like them because I like the freshness of them. I like the spontaneity of them. And also when I drew them, I didn't know that I was going to draw this. I didn't know that that was going to look so Freddy Krueger and so violent and so painful. And I didn't know that she was going to, you know, it was this giant crystal carpet thing and the bed cover and her face being sad and tired. And it goes really well with the show. And to me, the, the, Harry chose this one for the show and I chose this one. And to me, they, the only thing I was worried about is because they're so raw and uh, that they might have stuck out too much in the show with the other works, because the other works are so dense and so worked. But actually, I like it because I think that they open the space up and I think they go really, really well with Lindsay's work. So, but, um, yeah, it was fun curating the show, a lot of fun. I come in here last week and I just had a complete tantrum, like a little mini fit about everything, thinking, oh my God, what have I done? None of this is going to work, it's not going to go together. And then it's brilliant curating and you really push and squeeze and pull things about. And then, and also we made loads of little changes to the room as well. We got rid of all the radiators, <laughs> right? And, and, and then I got rid of a few radiators out there. And then we got, and then there's always this big thing. I go, well, yes, at the TK, the TK studios, you know, there's heating all the time. And I cover all the heating bills because I don't like think artists should be cold. And then I'm going around going, get rid of that radiator, get rid of that radiator, get rid of that radiator. But um, it, it feels so good without the radiators in here because the space looks so nice. And when we do light, when we, when we do life drawing, because we do life drawing every every other Tuesday, we'll just bring some heaters in rather than the life model will be freezing otherwise. But I, and also the show continues downstairs as well. So, but I'm 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 pleased. I'm I'm pleased that all all of this work is from artists at, at this studio. It's Margate, you know, and it's on such a high amazing level. It's really brilliant. You, you saw this group show anywhere, you'd say, well, that's kind of like a really interesting show. I wonder how they chose the artist. You know, we just went round the studios and said, put your work in the, in the room. So and I'm, I'm really pleased. I'm, I'm pure. And I have a studio here now. I have this, the tiniest studio in the whole building. It's like a tiny, tiny little room. But it's made me really happy. And it was good for me when I was doing the... Um, title on the wall outside as well because I felt like I was like I just got my paint from my studio and I went there and painted it so yeah it's good to be part of something artists get lonely because if, if you're really sincere about what you're doing it's a lonely pursuit being an artist and I think this in downstairs we've got a library and we've got coffee and tea and then of course over there we've got Lee's um uh What's it, kitchen? What's it called? Trainee kitchen, where we've got like young people coming in, learning everything about catering and stuff. And that, that, that's going to be really good to help unemployment, to give people um, cat catering skills, culinary skills. And we've got the life drawing here. We've got all kinds of things happening. And if anybody came to the summer fete, did anyone here come to the summer? It was a lot of fun, right? <laughs> Even the rain. I mean, all things like that just add good spirit. And art is a really positive thing. Art isn't a bad thing. Art is a really good thing. So if we make art in this building, those good feelings and that good energy just pushes its way through Margate. People feel it. This is really good. Cross the road over there. All the doors on the houses were really horrible. Really horrible, old grey, fucked up paint doors and everything. And I sit here and I, sit and I think, one day I'm just going to go over there and paint those doors, right? I'm just going to get the paint, I'm going to paint the doors for the people because those doors are so rough kind of thing. And then I'm sitting there one day and I go, oh my God, look, they're changing all the doors. And they've got all new doors on the houses. And it looks much, much nicer over there. And people are much happier with their new doors. And then the people saying, oh, yeah, you've done, made the street look so nice, Tracy. We thought we'd have to smarten up the houses a bit. Good, good. Smarten up the houses, <coughs> smarten up the whole town. But I've still got to get rid of that nappy that's up the road if anyone's walked past it. You know, the state of the rubbish and everything. I'm quite... 
I want, every, I want to have a cleaning day in Margate where everybody cleans the streets, you know, something like that. You can't wait around waiting for people to do it for you. If you can do it, do it. If you can't do it, you can't do it. But if you can, do it. And I also say another thing. If it's because of, if, if it's because of money, and so, if something needs to be done and it's because of money, it isn't being done, if you've got the money, just do it. So that's the same for governments, that's the same for councils, that's the same for people like me, it's the same for everybody. Don't wait to be given permission. Don't wait to be told you can. If you can do it, just go and do it. Change things, change things for people. Like me, I, I would have just gone and painted those doors. I would have done it to make that street look nicer. And that's a metaphor for everything that I do. I'm not going to sit around waiting for permission. I'm going to go and do something and I'm going to change something. So, yeah. And it's like next thing changing is the pavilion. I, I, the pavilion down in Westbrook. Um, I'm, it's going to be a swimming club for people in Margate or Thanet. And, you know, and it's going to be for winter swimming and we're going to have like really good showers and, and a steam room and everything and a cafe and a coffee bar. And it's going to be like a club, like a winter swimmers club. And it's going to be amazing. And all the people that swim at Walpole, you've got the Walpole people and then you'll have the, the Westbrook people and people can take long walks from one to the other. And people will be coming to Margate for the weekends for winter swimming. It will change everything. It will heighten everything. It's just an idea, but I can do it, so I make it work. Yep. It's not all about art. It's other things that happen. Other things need to be done too. Totally. Yeah. Tracy Emin, thank you so much. Thank you.